Holzman, and this is Confessions of an SEO. These episodes are short, and I hope they provide you with a fresh perspective and the courage to come to your own conclusions based on data and testing. Hello, this is this week's Confession of an SEO. Now, unfortunately, I took a look at the calendar, so we have less than six weeks until we're all trying to figure out where in the hell our WordPress theme uh, is the setting where we update the copyright date on all our sites and our clients. And I know you fancy pants people know the HTML code for the year to automatically update. And I'm sure on 99.95% of my sites, I, I'm sure I could set that up. And I would probably thank ChatGPT or Claude for the assist. Who knows? This might be the last year that I ever change my copyright dates manually. Are you ready? Likely by the time this show drops, Google will have announced the end of the update. Actually, I have data that uh, shows me and I called it uh, having ended on November 21st. So I just don't blame me. I just follow the data and that's what it told me. Now, speaking of data, for those of you that have websites, those that don't, I just want to thank you for being here. Uh, I don't want to get too big ahead thinking that you don't have to be a SEO geek to find value in these ramblings. Thank you for being here. Now, for the rest of you, listen up. If you have sites in the Google Search Console dashboard, the amount of information you can glean from what I'm about to tell you Uh, is something that I don't think a lot of us understand or even do. Have you ever downloaded the index page coverage reports in there? I started doing that for my test sites and it has been another level SEO education. Now, just spitballing here, but my hypothesis on this process is, well, and just remember you're three minutes in and or less than three minutes in, and you're getting hit with a hypothesis. But if during an update, there were index pages getting moved out of the index, how would we know? A rank tracker, uh, what is it? A rank tracker might tell us something dropped, but there's value in understanding why any page would get kicked out of the index in my book. And I bet that especially on a site composed of minimally viable content, if I knew which pages were getting kicked out during an update, I could look at their sorry content asses and devise what portions of the algorithm may have targeted those pages. They might all share something similar or not. So like a broken record, I'm going to again remind everyone that When one is testing, what you want to do is go on the quiet edges of the SERPs. You know, there are so many things going on in these competitive areas like Roofing Houston that you might not easily see how Google is quietly chipping away at pages that were indexed and taking them off the SERPs, kind of like shaving the fat out. Now, Due to these factors, whatever factors that got them out, I think is going to give us some clues. So here's what I'm working on. And remember one of the things everybody said they wanted to know, what are you doing? Okay, so I've been downloading those index page reports now for a couple of months. And uh, there was a huge chunk of content. And when I say huge, I mean like 50 pages of content that was tossed out of the SERPs in the November 1st report for one of my minimally viable test sites. Now, these page report updates in Search Console, they happen mostly every three days. So I have gotten at least two per week for a while, and I'm comparing them to each other. For example, on list A to list B, and then seeing which URLs that were in list A that were not in list B, and then eyeballing them like an SEO peasant. (laughs) I say that because I constantly find there's a bias in SEO that somehow 
really high level SEOs have graduated from the boring task of actually looking at content and instead just run tools. Now, I've been known to refer to those um, folks as executive SEOs, a necessary evil. My goal, however, is never to be one of them. In my humble opinion, I say that the operational distinction of a really high level SEO is how willing they are to manually look at things on a page. Sure, use tools, but add in that manual, hands-on eyeball. So, I, that means list A gets compared to list B. And then a few days later, list B gets compared to list C. And a few days after that, list C gets compared to list D. Because I want to find out what compelled Google to give that content the bums rush out of the index. So that's what I'm going to find out. And my hypothesis is by doing this, I will get an insight into what this last core update that just finished, what they were targeting. And I will publish it. And if you're a curious George, I will share it first with those in my Indexilla testers group. And I figure those people are trying to get content indexed might have a vested interest in this data and information. So if you would like to be in the testers group, go to indexzilla.io. So it's index, I-N-D-E-X, and Zilla, Z-I-L-L-A. And there you will find a link to a form. When you click on it, you'll get to a form and you can give your name, the email. There's some questions about your thoughts about indexing in general. There's no wrong answer. And the first week in December, you will have a testers account that will, in addition to giving you 100 credits to use to get content indexed, it will also entitle you to actually see my report on likely reasons why content was excluded during this update. There. Now, I also want to mention a Black Friday offering from some friends of mine, um, Entity Elevation. That's Clinton Dixon and Daryl Osborne. They have a membership group that during Black Friday promotion, they have, um, they if you take them up on their offer, they include a bonus, which is access to their new SEO testing group. So instead of the regular monthly, monthly fee, they have a one price option that basically helps you save $1,000. Now I'll put all the links in the description, but if you want to just write this down, entityelevation.com, and it's going to all be there. Plus they have some standalone options and I definitely recommend anything these guys put out. I'm in their group and no, this is not an affiliate situation. I just really like what they're doing. Now to the portion of the podcast about the running test regarding the helpful content, let's, let's call it the helpful content classifier. Does it actually read content? More precisely, does it read the words in between our optimizations? Now, if this is your first visit to Confessions, let me get you up to speed. I have a validated hypothesis, both by data and by Google itself, from the leaked API document where they discussed how Google measures a topical radius, not just, let's say, by the page itself, but to the collection of pages on a specific domain. In short, my hypothesis is there's no such thing as helpful content. There is only unhelpful content, which anything that isn't unhelpful then by default is helpful. Now that's a little um, tangled, isn't it? So unhelpful content is either in my books, either duplicate content taking the form of some technical issue or repeatedly writing content that hits on the same topical node. Also known as old school SEO that was organized by keyword phrases. That now if you're answering the same question, even though you're using different keyword phrases for each page, that 
is not going to help you. All right, now that being said, I kind of gave you a little background there. There is a loud contingent in the SEO world that do not see helpful content in the same way. They do not have data, but they seem to believe that helpful content is a thing. Either it's present or it's not. And if it's not present, that is when you get penalized. Or if people visit the content, they click and show some measurable behavior that Google interprets as helpful. Um, but that, that's kind of like, these are guesses, right? Um, so in the method of the process of elimination, I thought it only fair that I uh, decided to see if the algorithm is reading the words in between our optimizations and judging them to be helpful or not. Now, I launched a test based on the method of Kyle Roof, who I was testing with back in 2015 before any of the testing groups were even a glint in anyone's eye, but his groundbreaking test regarding rhinoplasty plano, this was a contest he entered where with only keywords and related entities and words that act like entities, um, with only those words and lorem ipsum, well, that was all the, the t uh, filler text in between the optimizations and a certain amount of backlinks, he was able to rank number one for the term rhinoplasty plano. Someone outed the test, focused on what was interpreted as Latin words, when in reality, Kyle's message by running that test was that Google is an algorithm. It doesn't read. It's math. And if you are mathematically more relevant for a topic than others, you rank higher. So my test is formulated to answer the question, does the helpful content classifier read the words in between all of our optimizations? I mean, because that's kind of what everyone is saying, that if you use more helpful content, that Google will reward you. So lorem ipsum, these are words that convey zero semantic meaning to the topic, any topic, but specifically in this case to the topic of rhinoplasty, which is, you know, nose surgery. So all these words that fill the spaces between the optimizations, there's literally nothing that one could even point to that is the helpfulness of these words, you know, in the writing of the content. It's like styrofoam peanuts when it comes to writing. It's filling the space in between the optimizations and that's it, it's conveying zero meaning. Now in the school of thought that helpful content is content in the specific words on the page that have nothing to do with, they're not topically helpful, but they are helpful to a reader as defined as helpful content, you know, measured by Google and then the Roman emperor thumbs up, thumb down method. Um, this content on these test pages is really only optimization. So there's no words in between that could convey such a state of helpfulness. You know, if these words were read, the absence of any helpful content in the text would likely result in not even getting these pages indexed and certainly not ranking for a desired term. So you might be saying, well, what happened, Carolyn? All right, test one with no backlinks. The site's homepage is ranking on page one last time I checked in the number nine spot, and that was locally and globally. So the results of that first test was the lack of the helpful kind of content did not hinder this test. But as a tester, you know, you have to have more than one experiment for the results or the conclusion of the results to be more valid. You know, can they be repeated or was this simply a fluke? Hence, Tests two and three. Now these were slightly more refined launches of the same content, but in two more cities. One is a large suburb of a major city where I expect rougher competition. 
and obviously the absence of the backlinks in this test would likely play a part in the ranking. And then the second city is a much, much smaller city that might yield more easily without having to include backlinks in there. Now last week when I did the audio version of the overshoulder launches, um, I shared that in analyzing the results of test one, I saw that only one of those nine pages of the site was coded with a meta description. When the original site was launched, that was likely, you know, the, the meta description at that time was likely an indexable zone. It no longer is, but in the spirit of aiming for the most replicated version of the original sites, I had to do some coding and found a way to adjust the theme to remove all mentions of descriptions except for that one inner page. That is not something that was arbitrary, I'm sure, on Kyle's part. I'm absolutely convinced it was deliberate, not because uh, I, I knew how he accounted for everything in his tests, but that particular feature is not something you can do by accident. Now, a very interesting thing happened with these two tests. Now, mind you, these two were launched during the latest core update. So it was a, a real roll of the dice. There was no problem with test two, uh, which is, you know, rhinoplasty city, whatever that city is, I'm not gonna share it. Um, uh, there was no problem getting that content indexed. And as of this past weekend, the home page was ranking on top of page two, and I'm sure with time it will make it to page one. So the results of test two came to say the lack of the helpful kind of content did not hinder this test and we had identical results as test one. Now the issue came with test three. The home page was canonicalized to, wait for it, Test page number one homepage. Now, I know a lot of inexperienced SEOs probably hear that and are like, oh no, that's horrible, that page is bad. Well, I'm here to tell you, it's not a forever tag. Canonicalization, canonicalization can be treated. So if you know how to get content uncanonicalized, that's what you do. So I did it. I call it uniqueifying. So, I made the home page of that test three unique to itself when compared to the other two tests home page home pages and the strangest thing now this could be related to the update i don't know but the only page of that test site that was indexed and served was the inner page the rhinoplasty city inner page now it came in on page nine of the results and it has stair stepped its way up to the middle to top of page four um, at spot number 34. Now, when you're looking at those results, the lack of the helpful content, you know, kind did not hinder this test either. But the page chosen was not the home page, but the inner page with the meta description, and that page is the only one that was indexed and served. Now, I'll get to what I think is in play, but when considering the original hypothesis, all three tests gave strong signals that there was no problem at all by not having any helpful content. You know, because not even math can gather any signal or noise from lorem ipsum. It just really doesn't matter. They are literally in, in, real, in a real state of styrofoam peanuts. Now, all three with those similar enough results lead me to say helpful content classifier is not reading our content. So let's just say this louder for the ones in the back. There is no such thing as helpful content. You cannot be a helpful content writer. At best, you can be an unhelpful content avoidance writer because it has nothing to do with how you write. It is what you write about. Now, some I'm sure are wondering about that 
their test. Because I know if I heard this, that's where I would have been like, well, what makes you think? Why did only that one page get uh, indexed? So here's what I think. That what I was looking at in that third one is what I call a syndication filter. Each of these sites had eight to nine pages that were identical except for the mention of the city. Now, two of these home pages were also identical with the same exception, you know, for the city name. One of the three home pages canonicalized to one of the other's home pages. And when it was modified to be unique, only the inner page of the rhinoplasty uh, city page was indexed and served. Now, I prefer to describe things as they are so that there's no confusion as to what I mean. In short, I'm about to share, you know, this is my pet peeve, right? So when some refer to this situation as I've described, they use the term duplicate content. But in this context, while all of these pages are mostly replicants of, it, of each other, they are not on the same domain. So like if you think about press releases. Now, the important part of that is at most, we only see two URLs of any press release in the SERPs. And that's why I think it's a syndication filter uh, in that third version of the test, which also meant the other pages were not, not indexed. Now, all that aside, it doesn't change the conclusion about the helpful content classifier in that the classifier does not read the words in between our topical optimizations. Now, for more about what the classifier does measure, you can find out, and I will give you all the data, and you can get it yourself. You can check out my analysis if you Google these words, decoding the helpful content system, and you want to look for the Gumroad URL. If you want to get in and be a tester of the indexation platform, this is likely going to be the last call. December 3rd, we're going to be opening it up a little further. So go to indexilla.io. It will say the site is under construction, but the platform is completed. Use the link to go to the Google form to apply to get in before December 3rd. Oh, and you'll get to see the logo that made the cut. And best of all, you get an indexer and all of it on my dime during the test phase. And the report, I will share when I complete the analysis so we can see what this last update was targeting. As far as the indexer feedback is coming in and people are loving the results, would love to see you there and be a part of it. That's it for me this week. If you need help with your site, you're not sure where to dig, text me. My specialty is forensic SEO. I find weaknesses in sites and bring solutions to strengthen them so you have more success through your site. To stay on the cutting edge of the state of indexing, as well as accessing this new indexer on the market, uh, check out Crawl or No Crawl on Substack. Thank you for being a listener. If you have any questions or topic ideas, I'd love to hear from you. You can text confessions at 512-222-3132. Thanks again, and until next week, I'll see you in the SERPs.